Welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. I'm Mark Rudin, and we're building the Catalina Wherry. In our last episode, we made the plank keel. Now, the thing that is typical of wherry construction is the presence of that plank keel. And that's really just a keel that is made out of a plank laid on its face, as opposed to on its edge, like you would have in a boat that has a skeg. Now, the advantage of a plank keel is that there's a simplicity of construction, and the finished boat can sit upright on its keel. That's really useful if you're working the boat off of a beach as opposed to off of a dock, for instance. You can launch and retrieve that boat very easily without it digging into the sand. Now this week, we're gonna look at laminating our stem and stern knee. There's three ways you can make a curved part for a boat. You can use a grown crook, you can steam bend, or you can laminate it. Now I neither have an abundant source of crooks to do a grown crook from, nor do I have a readily available source of good quality steam bending wood. And so laminating is the best option for me. And to laminate something, we need to start with a mold. Now I'm making my molds out of MDF, that's medium density fiberboard. Now I could also be using plywood, particle board, or even OSB, oriented strand board. Now MDF is a good choice for me because it's relatively inexpensive for the most part and it works nicely. We can get us a nice stiff mold out of it uh, for relatively little cost because this is essentially a disposable item. So one of the nice things about MDF is that there's no grain orientation to worry about and you can clean up the cut faces of it really nicely with sanders. Now the downside is that small parts are easy to blow apart with fasteners being pushed through them. So you have to be careful to use glue and usually a brad nailer is a good choice to assemble these things. Now I'm making what is essentially a solid mold. That means it's a mold that is made up to mimic the shape of the part that I'm making with parallel sides. And generally it's solid all the way through, but in this case, for the sake of economy, I'm just going to be using little webs between two outer faces. Now the advantage of a mold like this is you can do a lamination on it and you can move it to a different part of the shop very easily. The downside is that it uses up some material and it takes a bit of time to fabricate it. Okay, I'm just putting together a stem mold here. And rather than build it up out of uh, solid stacks of wood, I'm just um, making a top and a bottom plate and then just adding and blocking in between. It's kind of a coin toss, which one is the better way to go. This one certainly uses up a lot less material. Of course, ideal would be to have a clamping table with sort of T-slots in it that you could set up little right angle brackets. Just make, say, a plywood template or door skin template of your part and then just slide brackets into position. That would be lovely, but I do not have the space for that. It's not like I'm laminating something different every other day. If I was, that kind of table would make complete sense. But it's like, eh, you know, laminations like this happen every few months maybe. I'd rather not have the junk hanging around the shop. The shop is already absolutely packed with the rafters. Too many times I've had molds and templates and all kinds of junk lying around for some boat that I built that I thought this is a great boat surely surely another person's gonna come along and ask for one never happens not until like 10 years later of course I suppose I could be smart about it and try to keep flogging the same boat but I don't know
Now, those of you who follow Bob Emser from The Art of Boat Building know that he's building a dinghy for the Acorn to Arabella guys. And you might have seen him laminating his stem using a slightly different technique than I am. Bob is essentially working directly off of his lofting. He's applied it to a three quarter inch piece of plywood and he's working up at his bench level. So Bob's using little wooden blocks like this for creating his mold and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Of course, you need to pre-drill so that you don't blow these apart. These need to be long enough so that when you're laminating and you're clamping onto these and the laminations start applying stress to these blocks, they've gotta be deep enough that they aren't gonna rip right out of the surface, the material that you're screwed to. If you make them too long though, you're gonna need much longer clamps in order to reach around the blocks and the thing you're laminating. So the size of your clamps that you have at your disposal might be the determining factor for how big a block you can use. Now I've often made sizable blocks, usually about six inches long at a minimum. And one thing I like to do is chamfer the ends of it off just on the one face. And that's because as you're stacking these around the inside curve of a thing you wanna laminate, having a narrower face on that inside curve ensures that you're not gonna get a really faceted result. If you've got a very wide face, the corners of that block are ten gonna tend to dig into the lamination and you may not get a very good result unless you can have a sacrificial layer on there. So narrowing that down really helps, but we still wanna have a nice wide landing for the toe of your clamp so that it's got plenty to hang on to. Now there's a couple options. If this isn't gonna work for you, if the smaller blocks aren't gonna work out for you, you could try making little plywood L's like this, and that could work out just fine. Of course, I would glue and screw them together because there can be quite a bit of stress on these guys. And it being a little plywood L means it's gonna be a little easier to fasten these down because you drill some holes in there and you can use shorter screws. You could also use uh, little sections of aluminum angle iron or even the pre-perforated steel angle iron. Now, the pre-perforated stuff is usually fairly small in dimension, so it may not be deep enough for the height of your lamination. But what you could do is you could fasten another little wooden block onto it like so, that is the depth of your laminations. That could do the job of providing the clamping surface that you need. One of the things that I've always felt is very important when you're doing a lamination, and that is to provide something that the lamination sit on that isn't just a flat table surface. Theoretically makes sense to be working off a flat table surface. Once you start applying glue and applying pressure to it, the squeeze out will work against you. And uh, you might ha even have trouble squeezing out the necessary adhesive if the surface of the table isn't allowing that glue to escape. And so for that reason, I will use little cleats that I'll put down on the tabletop surface so that once I start putting my lamination stacks on there, there's somewhere for the glue to go. And when I want to clamp those laminations down to keep them from sliding, I will clamp them down over top of those cleats. Now, while Bob's method is much faster than mine, there are limitations to it. He's able to get away with just fastening these blocks to a three quarter inch piece of plywood coming down from the surface into the ply. So there's not a lot of grab there. Those screws at best have about five eighths of an inch of grab. Now, because the stem is quite light, he can get away with that. Now I know for a fact that if I were to try and do my stem that way, I would rip those blocks right off the plywood. And I know this because I've tried it in the past. I've often had to go to the extreme of applying the blocks and then fastening them from the backside. And it's a real hassle to do that. And even if you get all of that working, that plywood is gonna potato chip on you once you start applying a lot of strain onto those blocks. And so you gotta clamp it down to the work surface as well. By the time you've gone through all of that hassle, I think it's easier to just make a solid mold like I'm doing here. And over here, we got our molds made up. So this is going to be for the stern knee. And basically the stern knee is gonna be this one laminated member that comprises like the toe of the knee and transforms into the, a little stern post. And we're just gonna use like some solid dead wood material to fill out that shape. So it's gonna be like one bent layer right here and then this little filler piece. This is gentle enough. You could have, we could have even steam bent that too, but uh, I didn't really feel like getting into steam bending stuff, at least not for this part of the project. And, um, and then this is our stem mold and this will be just one big full lamination two inches thick all the way around 
by about two and a half inches wide. So that's going to work out pretty nice. And two inches doesn't sound like much for a stem, but then we're adding like another uh, like seven eighths of an inch of steam bent white oak to the outside of it. And so that's going to add to this, the strength as well. So the white oak steam bent part is going to be basically a cut water. And then the rest of this is going to be inboard, but just a laminated stem out of a yellow cedar, I think. Okay, this is a real simple way to prevent binding when you're cutting something without a riving knife on your saw. Just a piece of scrap that's the thickness of your saw kerf, a couple of finishing nails to keep it from falling out. It works like a charm. Chopping into what is basically a 3x6 or a 3x8 piece of dead clear yellow cedar 12 feet long. Yeah, it kind of hurts to do that. And this was wider still. I took a piece of this out for the 2.4 meter. It was like that wide to start with. The reason I chose to do that is because for my purposes, for what I'm making right now, this is this particular cedar was perfect. It's just beautifully clear. It's the right weight. Sometimes you get yellow cedar that is really dense. And when you go to try and make up little laminations, sometimes it goes a bit squirrely on you or else you end up with something that's just way too heavy. And this is sort of a really nice, kind of a lighter weight yellow cedar. So it's kind of perfect for laminations. It's staying nice and flat. It's gonna bend nicely. The vacuum fence I was using on the table saw really helped to keep these consistent. Even as I was pushing it through, this billet's got a little bit of a whine to it. And the vacuum fence was keeping the stock up against the fence so that it, we were getting good, consistently thick cuttings as opposed to the stock lying on the tabletop and the cutting slowly winding out on us as we go because this thing's got a wind to it. So it was actually pulling this thing up off of the table saw top and hang on to the fence. So it, it worked really well. Uh, I ran it through the thickness planer and that's mostly just to make sure it's consistent. Just took a little skim off of it. Basically uh, these were all made a hair over an eighth of an inch thick and now they are just about an eighth of an inch. They're just a tiny smidge over actually. So when I was thicknessing this stuff, my first piece went through and I could hear the planer go chat, 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 and spitting out little tiny pieces. I knew right away I was going in the wrong direction. Flipped over the next piece and it went through perfectly smooth, pulling off nice thin little ribbons instead of short chunky bits. So uh, your ears can tell you as much as your eyes when it comes to thicknessing stuff and telling how the machine is reacting to a piece of material. All right, there we go. Uh, this is our billet of material for our laminations. So the plank was basically busted pretty close into two. You get to see exactly how much waste we have. And we have turned the equivalent of like an inch and a quarter of this yellow cedar into sawdust, which kind of blows. but. The way it goes, man, when you want to laminate something, you're going to make sawdust. But our yield is really quite good. I mean, if I get better than 50%, I'm happy. And uh, we certainly did that. So this is going to make up a two inch thick billet. And what I'm going to do now is just wrap this around my mold to figure out my length. Because um, don't forget, if you've got one end secured tightly, the other end is going to get a feathered tapered end because these pieces are going to slide along each other and stagger as it gets bigger. The radius changes and so the pieces grow. So we want to just make sure we got enough to get past our toe end of our lamination and then I can cut it off there. And then I need to rip a bunch of this down for our transom knee. It's not as wide a lamination so I'm not going to use all that material for that. So I've got to rip some down to about an inch and a half. Last detail is that I always mark the ends of my billet with a crayon here uh, so that I can identify how it went together and I can put it back together in the same orientation if I want, or if I'm getting some trouble with the planing, if it's only uh, wanting to go through the planer one orientation, it's easier to visualize how it's oriented going through. Because yellow cedar, it's almost impossible to read the grain on it sometimes. I mean, you're lucky if you can just read vertical grain and flat grain, but when you start look, thinking about the angles that the, the fibers are coming off of a particular piece, it's just so clear and featureless that it's really hard to distinguish what that might be. All right, I'm going to start laminating up our stem. I've already done the transom knee. And so this is one of the methods I use here is I, um, I make up a billet of my, my stock and 
generally I'll get it all lined up in one end. I'll have a backing board. This is basically a polyethylene sold as a, something called arena board. So it's, it's like, um, it's like high molecular density polyethylene, but sort of like the cheap ass version of it. And it works really well. Um, epoxy sticks to it a little bit, but not much. So I'll give myself a registration mark on one side here, just to be able to keep track of things. Cause I got my stack the way I like it with the face veneers that I want, making sure that I've got a planed veneer on the uh, show face. I'm careful to sort of keep this orientation. So there's my billet, there's my backing band, and we'll put a screw through this. In fact, I gotta go get a screw here. Hold on a second. This screw might even be on the light side, but it doesn't matter. This is really just to register it and just keep, prevent it from sliding all over the place. So there's our screw. And what I do is I take my first piece, that's gonna go like so. And then the next piece is going to go on top of that. So bring that down. Next piece, bring it down. I don't flop those yet. So I have sort of a very simple system. Now I got to go get mix up some epoxy. And then we start goobering up these guys in a very straightforward manner. I don't use thickened epoxy for these laminations. I used to, but what I found is when I look at the finished product, I end up with like a pretty good pool of squeeze out on the top of this lamination by the time I'm done to the point that like even if it was thickened I would just be fighting to get the whole lamination uh, squeezed together. So I figure I'm getting really good contact. I'm just going to go with the unthickened. I'll get good penetration that way. It also makes it easier to apply. So if I thicken it, it makes it harder to sort of squeegee it on. But if I use it unthickened, I can roll it on. And I know it's going to work out fine in the end because I've done it so many times. Now I will often use with Systems 105-207. That's the special coatings hardener, which is the slowest, slowest curing one uh, compared to the, except for the tropical one. Or I'll use uh, just regular slow epoxy. I think I'll use the slow today because I'm a little shy on the 207 and I got some more stuff to do with it. So um, I'd rather use up the slow that I have on hand. It's a pretty warm day, so I gotta work fairly quickly, but uh, it'll work out okay. So I'm gonna do my epoxy in a couple batches so that it doesn't kick off too fast. And I will be back in a second. I just use a paint tray for doing this. A low pile foam roller. And we just liberally lay this stuff on here. So of course we want to be very thorough. Every tiny little square inch of it gets covered. And at first I'm just worried about getting a good penetration coat. So it's just lay it on, lay it on hard. Make sure everything is getting something that can saturate in a little bit. Okay, so there's my first one. I'm gonna lay that on my batten here. I knew I should have made my, okay, I have to add that later. Um, I should have made this hole just a little bit bigger, but I didn't want it sliding around everywhere on me. Okay, so now that I've got a saturation coat on there, I'm just gonna lay on one more coat that's just a little bit wetter. Especially this whole outside veneer has got a bit of a rough, a rough backing to it here. Okay. That's just to make sure we don't starve the joint. Now, flip this one over. Good. Wet that out. Okay, that's wet out. And now, grab this guy. Put on that slightly wetter coat. Not too much, because it is mostly going to squeeze out. And then flip that one over. And there we go. We just made a little stack. And I kind of repeat this. So bring the next one down and the next one down like so. And I've played around with just like filling up the whole table with strips. But you know what? It doesn't make 
make it any easier. It just gets more confusing, if anything. This keeps it nice and simple. By using more than one batch of epoxy for doing this glue up, it keeps the stress level down. Epoxy is exothermic, which means as it cures, it produces heat. And the more epoxy you mix, the more heat it produces and the faster it cures. It's a vicious cycle. Because I use a mixing wand on my drill to mix up my epoxy, it's pretty fast to mix up another batch. Okay, so here's our mold. piece of wood that matches our blocking on the mold. So the mold I've got it taped off and I've added these little feet on here and these are all for alignment. Um, that's so that because if you don't contain the stack this way it's going to start sliding all over the place especially if your veneers aren't dead even. And that's a good reason to actually throw them through the thickness planer just to make sure that they're actually nice and even all the way across when tapered veneer could send things out of, totally out of whack. So that just tacks it in place. Clean up this goo right here now. Okay, we're not going to try and do any cleanup on this lamination when we're done. This is just gonna, we're gonna glue it up and that's it, just leave it alone. Okay, so we've gotta work our way along. And of course, uh, we're gonna need goodly number of clamps. But because of the bend, you actually need fewer clamps than you think if your veneers are, have a bit of stiffness to them and you have a good stiff backing band or one with some weight to it. Um, the actual bending is going to be applying a lot of pressure, more than you might think. Okay, so I've got a bunch of blocks here. I don't know if my clamps can reach the whole way across. Now when you're making your mold, here's a couple things to think about. First of all, it's got to be stiff enough to resist the bend. And these things look like they're light and floppy, and they are when you're playing with them. But the moment you start bending them around this mold, oh my god, the, the uh, amount of strain that you have to put on to move them is unbelievable. Slightly less beefy pads. So I'm going to try and use C-clamps for a bunch of this. Um, C-clamps are probably, I mean, F-body clamps are by far probably the best for doing this, or even better, these parallel jaw clamps, because they, because they spread the load so nicely. However, C-clamps can really add the pressure that you want. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to gently squeeze them here and get them going around the corner. And then I'm going to add another pad that's going to help compress it and keep it in shape. And as I get down around the bend, I'm probably going to have to switch to F-body clamps just because these C-clamps aren't going to be able to open far enough to grab the stack because it's going to be splaying open. I'm going to try and I'm trying to clamp this right smack dab in the center. Okay, so just a little gentle squeeze. I want I don't want to squeeze it so hard that I can't move this stack now. So now I've got these other pads that I already have on hand that taped off and I need a little shim. I made my backing band the exact same thickness as the rest of my stack. Ran them all through the table saw it the same. And now we're just going to add this little, this little guy. And a little, because I made, I made all of it just a hair bigger than my mold for, on purpose, and that's so that I could do this. Basically, it allows me to kind of cantilever this little cleat over top of the stack and squash it down. Because I know I'll never get it exactly perfect. Better to have the stack be a hair high and then use a little shim to make sure this block clears.
clears the mold and presses down on the stack. So now that that's done, I can add another clamp here. Now I got, I stupidly did not pay much attention when I was doing my, um, my little legs. I should have made sure that they jumped in between my clamping positions. And because this mold is not solid, because it's made up of like little webs, my clamping positions are limited. Next one. Yeah, it's happening right on top of the stack again. Right on top of the leg. Maybe I can get away with not, yeah, I can probably get away with holding off on another downward pressure clamp for a bit. Okay, now we're getting to the point where this really needs to start moving quite a bit. And so I usually have a quick grip on hand to help start pulling this in. better to just sort of walk your way around. Don't try and pull it all the way around in one shot. You're gonna get a better result if you can clamp as you go. These guys. This MDF is a little annoying to work with just because it's kind of hard. It's like soft and hard at the same time. It's weird stuff there. Eh? And as a result, you can't just drive a screw into it without putting up a fight. And in terms of your epoxy kicking off, you got time. You don't have to go crazy. Once you got it on there, once you don't have it all sitting in a, in a pot, here, the whole relationship changes. I'm gonna to get one more on and then I gotta move my stack here. I gotta move my mold, shift it around a bit. Another thing to consider is when, you, when you're doing this is, can you leave the thing wherever you're doing this? By the time you've got all these clamps on here, this thing is heavy. <laughs> this thing's really heavy. the beefiest of my clamps. When I really gotta move something, this is the one I pull out. And as you go, you gotta go back and sort of check your other clamps because sometimes all this, as you move forward, everything's squeezing tighter and tighter and these other guys loosen up. It's kind of annoying if they fall off on you. All right. And the stock's tendency to want to slip increases as you come around a tight bend, so that's also something to watch for. Increase your legs, the number of legs you use around bends. Okay, now right now I can see the sink stack starting to slide. And it looks like it does not want to come down quite properly, so I'm going to give it a little extra squashing with a clamp. If I can reach it.
So one thing I want to just mention is when you're when you're making your billet for your finished part, try and make it a quarter inch thicker than your finished part. Bare minimum an eighth inch thicker because there is more than you think going on when it comes down to dressing this off. There's sometimes little bits, you know, sometimes you didn't glue it enough and you get some voids near the edge or sometimes um, things are a little bit squint. You know, if you couldn't clamp it down properly, it could sell squint and then when you go to plane it off, you can't get it squared up if you don't have enough meat. So don't skimp on the meat. So pretty successful day, I think. Got this glued up, got the knee glued up, got glass on the uh, plank keel. I've got two skim coats on top of the actual glassing on the um, the keel. I'm going to try and get one. I'm going to get one more on by the end of the day. It's getting late though. I'm probably getting on to about 4:30 or something. Time to knock off and put, pour food into the family. But um, I'll come back down here later on tonight and finish up. Put another skim coat on that, and that should be enough to be able to sand out that bottom plank. And, uh, and have it ready for paint, essentially, which means it's ready for installation. So there we have our stem and stern knee laminated up, and we will save shaping those into finished parts for a future episode. Now I want to thank Bob Emser of The Art of Wooden Boat Building for letting me use some footage for this video. If you haven't checked out Bob's channel yet, please go do that. And I also want to thank everybody on Patreon who helps support these videos. If you can help me out on Patreon, I really appreciate that. And you can find links for that in the corner or down in the description. So thank you all for watching. Please join me again next time. See you later, folks.